As we continue our, our journey through Genesis, uh, Genesis 38, there's now kind of a, sort of an interesting break in the narrative, although it fits, as you'll see. Uh, we're looking at the story of Joseph, and we'll be in the story of Joseph for the rest of Genesis. But this is going to focus in here, Genesis 38 on one of Joseph's brothers, Judah. Judah, who is the ancient relative of King David, also of Jesus. Actually a very significant figure in the redemptive story. That's why I think that the writer of Genesis, Moses here, takes his cues from the Lord to single out the story of Judah. And I think it has a lot of import for our lives as well. Now I call this sermon the uphill journey, okay? And I'm going to use that phrase, the uphill journey, as an analogy for your life of discipleship in Christ. Because I'm telling you this morning... <laughs> It is an uphill journey, amen? <laughs> it is an uphill journey. It's not just a journey. It's not just an easy journey. It's not a short journey. It's an uphill journey. But I use the analogy in two ways. If I were to say, hey, you know what? I want to invite you to come and w- together with my family, we're going to climb up King's Peak, right? The tallest peak in Utah, almost 14,000 feet, right? If I were to invite you to come on that hike with us, you'd probably be thinking two things to yourself at that particular point. First of all, you'd be thinking to yourself, wow, that's going to be really hard to, the, to hike to the top of King's Peak. That's almost 14,000 feet. That's going to be a really difficult hike, right? You'd be thinking that to yourself for sure. But you'd also be thinking to yourself, you know what? To hike to the top of King's Peak, uh, that's going to be beautiful up there. I'm going to be transported to a beautiful place up there at the top of King's Peak, that would totally be worth it. It'll be hard, but it'll be totally worth it. Once I'm transported to the top, and you know, even even along the journey, it's going to be really beautiful, right? So actually, the uphill journey is an analogy that brings to to mind two things for your Christian life. First of all, it's going to be hard. If anyone invited you into the life of the Christian journey and said it was going to be easy let me tell you something. They lied to you. It's not. It's not a bed of roses. It's not a cakewalk. Certainly Jesus didn't invite people and give them that kind of impression when he, when he called people to follow him, right? What did he say? Like I said in my prayer, he said, if anyone would be my disciple, now this is Jesus talking. So I think he would know what he's talking about, right? He said, if anyone would be my disciple, he must what? Deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow after me. Cross means you better be willing to suffer as you're about to see me suffer when I get crucified on that cross. He said, I have a cross I'm going to take for you. But also there will be a cross for you as well. If they hated me, they'll hate you. We talked about that last week. There's persecution that happens in the Christian life here, right? But this uphill journey of discipleship that you're on, it will be both marred by sin and marked by repentance. It will both be marred by sin and marked by repentance. And you see this in the life of Judah. And you'll see this in your own life as well. This is something that I call biblical realism, right? Biblical real. You know, the Bible is a really real book, isn't it? It doesn't like hold back things, you know, like, like if you haven't had the talk with your kids or something and they're reading the Bible. I mean, like, you know, you're, you're going to get life in all of its beauty and glory and ugliness <laughs> straight up in the Bible, right? And it doesn't, this is actually something that's very unique to the Bible among other ancient Near East documents. The Bible, more so than a lot of those other stories or accounts, the history of Israel actually shows the sins and downfalls of even its most prominent heroes, Ancient literature is mostly just, you know, and this king so-and-so great conquered all these lands, and he was amazing, and and we worshipped him as a god, and he built all these... It just goes on and on about all their wonderful attributes, mostly written by people who were working for them. But the Bible actually is written by other authors many times, sometimes autobiography, but mostly other authors who are writing about someone, in this case Judah. Moses here is writing about Judah, And he gives you all of his real sins, struggles, but also his repentance and the fact that he was 
a disciple of God. He didn't know the name of Christ. But again, people in the Old Testament were saved in the same way that people in the New Testament were saved, by putting their faith in the one who saves. Amen? Though your life will be marred by sin as a disciple, it will also be marked by, dis- by repentance as well. So let's look at those first few verses there in 38. Let's read 1 through 23 first. You'll get kind of the first half of the story, and we'll go on from there. In 38. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son. And he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Kezib when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for, his, for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Pause here. There was an ancient Near East practice, and it was obviously practiced here as well, that if the husband died and there were other brothers that they would go and marry the deceased brother's widow in order to raise up offspring for them as well. So it's kind of like the unmarried brother would go, now you need to go and marry the widow and help provide for her and raise up children for your brother, in a sense, in his name as well. Okay, verse 9. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. In other words, Judah's, Judah's wife. And when Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah, Timnah to his shears, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, Your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it. Um, He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that's in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, Where is the colt prostitute who was at, and I am at the roadside? And they said, No colt prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of the place said, No colt prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. Not good. Now, Judah is one of the covenantal patriarchs of Israel. Like, Remember like the 12 tribes of Israel? Like one of them is Judah. <laughs> he is one of the top 12 patriarchs, right? The sons of Jacob, who will become the 12 tribes of Israel. He's a covenantal patriarch. Yet his sins are evident, are they not? You know, early on, last chapter, he already betrayed his brother Joseph into slavery, right? That wasn't so good. Uh, Now he's withholding the youngest son to marry Tamar. That's what should happen. But he's like, no, you just go live as a widow in your father's house, right? He's guilty of that. Then he's guilty of sleeping with someone who's not his wife. Then it says, Ur and Onan are apparently, his, his two oldest sons are apparently wicked without restraint, no repentance, in other words, and they're put to death by God prematurely, uh, which also highlights a possible parenting failure as well. 
Then it says his sons die. Then it says that his wife dies as well, right? Life is not going so well for Judah, it seems, right? This is an uphill battle, it seems, that he's in here, right? Even though he's he's surely been taught by his father, Jacob, of the God of the covenant, and presumably he's in that covenant, things are not going so well in this chapter for him. Uh, It's not only your sins that drag you down at times, right? And our sins do drag us down, and they discourage us. But it's also the sins of other people that drag us down and discourage us at times, and the general curse of sin to boot, death and death in this life, for example, as well. Um, and you see this not only here but throughout the Bible as well. There are many things that make the journey of discipleship an uphill journey. Even at co- even covenant believers' lives, right, are marred by sin, pre and post Christ. Even after you become a Christian, we still struggle with sin let alone the fact that we're weighed down by the sins of others and the trials of this life can get to us as well. I remember when I was in college, there was a teacher who who was like a guest lecturer who came to our college, and he was just kind of doing some lectures and whatever, but it was in a private setting where he was sitting at the dinner table with some other professors. And uh, he told this group of professors, this was at a Christian college, he he just kind of made an offhand comment at one point in the conversation, like, well, I, I haven't sinned in about four years. Like, <laughs> just like, just like it was like a normal thing to say. And uh, half the professors about choked on their food that they were eating, you know, like, <laughs> really? Four, four years, you know, really? Uh, you either have a really high view of yourself or you have a really low view of what sin is to be able to make that kind of comment, right? Uh, biblical realism, get real. You need to get real. You need to be honest with yourself about your sins. And you need to be honest with God about your sins. You need, you need to be honest with others about your sins. You know, I saw someone in a document this week who actually, who actually documented like 667 sins that they documented from the Bible, various different things in the Old Testament. 667. I mean, how many of those am I even aware of, let alone I'm actually guilty of, right? Do you even know the, the positive laws that you should know to not even do any of those sins, right? Uh, sin is real. It's real in our lives, right? You think about, um, think about various people in the Bible as well, right? Noah, Noah had a drinking problem. It says Moses had a temper problem. David had an adultery problem. Peter had a fear problem. But all of us have a sin problem, amen? All of us in our flesh have a sin problem. It's not just all those heroes, quote-unquote, of the Old Testament and even the New Testament, but it's our lives as well. We are marred by sin. We have a sin problem in our old flesh, the Bible says, even though we might be Christians, in fact. What are the sins that you're currently struggling with right now? Um, It's good to be conscious of our sins so that we might confess them to God and be forgiven. We shouldn't dwell on them too much. But we take them to the foot of the cross, we confess them to God, and we leave them there that they might be forgiven by him. Have you ever noticed that sometimes in your Christian life you kind of have a back and forth mentality as far as just what you want to do and how you feel about the Christian life? It's kind of back and forth, right? And you're like, ah, that's so, that's so annoying that I'm back and forth, that I'm not consistent. You see that in Judah's life here, right? As we go on as well, you'll see some, actually some redeeming things that he does, in addition to his sins, the, uh, further you go on in this chapter and in Genesis as well. You know, he's kind of back and forth. You see that in his life. Why is that? Why are we, why are we back and forth with sin and following God at times? Well, I'll tell you why. If you're a Christian, if you truly are a believer, first of all, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, okay? So the Holy Spirit is pushing you toward God more and more each day, and your conscience is on his side as well. Because even if you're not a Christian, your conscience convicts you of your sins. So if you're a Christian, your conscience and the Holy Spirit are like pushing you closer and closer to God each day. But there's also another factor, something else that the Bible calls indwelling sin. Indwelling sin. Sometimes it calls it the flesh. Your indwelling sin is constantly dragging you to hell. It's constantly trying to get you to go away from God, to go towards Satan, to go towards whatever it is that you want to do because 
Satisfy yourself, that's the number one thing, right? So it's this back and forth. Even the Apostle Paul, listen to what he says in Romans 7.21. Even the Apostle Paul. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. (laughs) Do you hear that? When I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. In fact, it's sometimes precisely when you want to do the right thing that the evil is coming up and sort of trying to drag you away. It's like the more you want to do something that's right, the more the evil within you is like, don't do it. Come the other way. Sin in a believer's life is one of the things that makes us the most unhappy. And we mourn over our sins, right? Why? Why is a Christian so upset over sin? Because we know that there's so much better in the palace of God. You know that there are such better things that he has for you in his presence and in the purpose in life that he would have for you, not your own way, right? You actually know that, and that's why you mourn so much over sin, and you should mourn over sin as well. Your journey will be marked by, it will be marred by sin, but it also will, it must, but it will actually be marked by repentance as well. And you see that in Judah's life. Let's read verses 24 through 30 right there. About kind of the end of the story here, right? About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Shelah. And he did not know her again. I mean, sleep with her. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb, and and when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. As he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out, and she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Your journey will be marred by sin, but it also must be marked by repentance. There's sort of this, like, turning point right here. Something happens in this guy's brain, life, mentality, right, where he is confronted, (laughs) I mean, slapped dead in the face with his sin. You know, first of all, he's a hypocrite. Like, let's let's burn her because she was guilty of sexual immorality when he was the one who impregnated her, right? So she actually calls out his bluff. She says, whoever's stuff this is, it belongs to you. That's who slept with me. And everybody's watching at this point. I mean, he has, he has, his dignity is gone in front of these other people. But even in front of these other people, when he's called out, he actually confesses his sin in front of these people and says, she is more righteous than I, in the sense of, not that what she did was so great either, But in a sense, she was actually less wicked than what I did. I did the wickedness, but then I was also going to be a hypocrite and condemn it as well. He realizes his sins, he confesses, and he repents. He has a change of heart according about his unrighteousness. And then he does the right thing, it says, by not sleeping with Tamar anymore. Even though at this point he probably would have provided for her, treated her like a wife, took her back into his house perhaps, but he did not sleep with her again. Later in in Genesis' account, he also confesses and repents of his sins toward Joseph. He's kind of the lead spokesman when it comes time to repent before Joseph as well. And he and Joseph um, are actually reconciled at that point, even though he sold his brother into slavery, right? You know, he and Joseph, as we're going to see in the rest of these chapters, you know, both going to graduate from the school of hard knocks. You know, this is, this is a tough life these guys live. And they're learning a lot. Just like Jacob. Wasn't it the same way with Jacob? <laughs> Didn't Abraham go through a lot of the same things as well? Oh, wait, Noah. You're going to see later with David. Oh, wait. They all graduate from the school of hard knocks. In the sense of God is leading them on this upward journey. It's a covenant journey where he said, I love you. I've chosen you. I want you for my disciple, and I'm not going to let you go. Even though you just fell straight face down in the mud. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to clean you off, and I'm going to bring you further along. 
Life is messy, is it not? I mean, we commit damnable sins. Let's just be honest with ourselves. But when you confess your sins and repent, God will forgive you. He'll do more than that. He'll restore even the punishments that he brought against you. The scripture says that he will restore to you the years the the locusts have eaten, which means even when God sends judgments against you for your sins, in other words, like discipline, he's disciplining you, he can make up even for those things that have come against you. He will bring you to glory by humbling you and bringing you really low. It says, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I think there are certain people in life who knew these truths. Uh, one of them was an Anglican priest in England whose name was John Donne. He was also a poet, actually. He, he wrote a lot of poetry that's recorded today. People, people read it because it's really good. Um, and he really, really struggled with sin. This guy really struggled just like you and I struggle. And he writes a lot about this, this messy kind of journey of discipleship in his poetry. You find it reflected there. And uh, Sonnet 14 is one of his that really reflects this. Listen to this one where he says this. Batter my heart, three-personed God, for you, as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like a usurped town, to another do, labor to admit you, but owe to no end. Reason your viceroy in me should defend, me should defend, but his captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie, or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you, enthrall me never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Did you hear those last lines? Except you enthrall me, never shall be free, never chaste, except you ravish me. The uncomfortably close love of God is your only hope, actually. <laughs> Nothing else is going to save you. If you, were, if you were looking to something else to save you, you might as well give up right now if you think that's going to help you in your struggle against sin, because it won't. We try to come up with all kinds of things, you know, like, oh, go to this AA group where you'll be free of alcohol. There's so many things we invent to try to, like, just better our lives. Or, oh, you know, maybe I need to turn a new leaf. Yeah. You know, maybe I need to wake up earlier in the morning. I need, I need to be more disciplined or whatever we come up with. But actually, those things will not save you. There's only one person who can save you, and that is Christ. There's only one way that sin can be dealt with, and that's if you take it to the cross and have Jesus kill it there. But if you recognize that the struggle against sin, the uphill journey of discipleship, is actually meant to surrender you more to God's love, then you're beginning to get it. You're beginning to get it. When you realize that this is all part of the process of God bringing you closer to himself, right? What sin is there in your life that you need to name this morning? You know, enough already. You name, call a spade a spade, right? Name sin and take it to the cross. Forgiveness awaits you there. If you don't go to the cross, there's no forgiveness. You'll be like Aaron Onan. They were wicked without repentance, and God put them to death. Whether God puts you to death early or you die on your own, you face the same thing, judgment. But when you go to the cross in repentance and humility, he will forgive you. You know, Repentance is a change of heart, right? It's a turning away. This is, my de- this is my definition of repentance. Repentance is a returning from the crack house of sin to the house of your Lord and lover. You know, so- someone's been living at the crack house for like seven days straight. Hi, they haven't even eaten any food this whole time. You know, apparently those, those places are, just pull you right in. People enjoy them. It wouldn't, it, people wouldn't go there if it wasn't fun, right? But you, when you turn to the house of your Lord and lover, when you wake up in the basement of that, of that place and you're thinking to yourself, I will arise and go back to my father's house. <laughs> That's the point of repentance. And you leave that behind and you go to a new place. But at first it starts with a heart change right here, right? 
You know, I said last week that Joseph was a type of Christ in a number of ways, and we're going to see that more and more, right? But in a sense, Judah is a type of you. <laughs> Judah actually shows you yourself, right? The life of the redeemed, which is marred by sin, yet marked by repentance. And what's going to happen in Judah's future? Actually, he's going to bow before Joseph in fulfilling prophetic dreams, and from Judah's clan will come the Christ. Christ is going to use this guy. God's going to use this guy. God used Judah and his family. Why? Because of his unconditional grace. That's why. <laughs> unconditional grace will grant you the gift of repentance, and it will forgive you all your sins. But it also will enable you to change and to become more like Jesus. This is what you need this morning in the midst of your battle. You have sinned, right? You have to acknowledge that first. You have sinned. You must repent. But God's unconditional grace will save you and bring you to the top of the uphill journey of discipleship, a beautiful place with him. Amen.